Morning. Morning. Happy Father's Day. Uh, just a little bit about my attire this morning. I'm sorry for you Bama fans in the front row. My, my apologies there. It's a bit of a tradition for our family. Uh, for probably like the last 10 years, uh, we typically wear uh, Tennessee stuff because we're Tennessee fans. My, my girls, my wife, Atlanta Braves fans, we wear our, our jerseys. Maybe that's something we can implement here as a church next Father's Day. If you have a favorite team, feel free to wear it, unless you're an Alabama fan. Sorry. <laughs> Can't do that, right? Uh, go ahead and flip to your uh, copies of the scripture of Matthew chapter 28. Matthew chapter 28, the back end, the Great Commission, if you will, uh, verses 16 through 20 is where we will be uh, this morning. Um, so what a pleasure it is any time to get up and, and in front of you, church, brothers and sisters, to proclaim the word of God. Uh, it's humbling and it's honoring, uh, and we give God the glory. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this morning, God. I, I, I thank you again for the opportunity to come and to fellowship with other believers, God, and to open, open up your word together and to study your word, God, and how powerful that is, God. And I thank you for each and every person here this morning, God. And, and I pray, Father, that uh, you would exclude me from this process, God, that you would push me away and let it be you and only you, God, that you would get the glory. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right. Bethany and her friend Ashley take walks in their local community and often talk about their growing families and the happenings in their neighborhood. Bethany wants to talk more about the faith they share. She'd like to invite Ashley to grow and learn as they follow Jesus together, but she isn't sure where to start. Brian loves playing basketball. At his local gym, when his son Joey started middle school, he began bringing him along. It's through their time together at the gym that important conversations happen. Sometimes Joey shares about what's going on at school and with his friends. Brian would like to pray for his son and begin to model to him what prayer could look like. This could be an opportunity for discipleship, but he wonders about the next step. Christine also wonders how to get started with discipleship. She would like to invite someone to study the Bible with her, but isn't sure who to ask. She's curious about how to find that person and what studying the Bible together would look like. Have you ever had similar questions? Situations? Not, not quite sure what the next step is? I think we all have, to some extent, right? Matthew chapter 28, verses 16 through 20, and allow me to give some context, because context is king. Our Lord had just risen from the dead. I'll say that again. Jesus just rose from the dead. That deserves an amen, and that deserves our worship, which is why we're here. Because if it didn't happen, why are we here? We believe that Jesus rose from the dead, physically, bodily, rose from the dead. Amen. He rose from the dead, and after he rose from the dead, uh, instances of, hey, this didn't actually happen is already starting to take place. Look at verse 11. Now, while they were going, behold, some of the guard came into the city and reported to the chief priest all the things that had happened. Huh, Jesus' body is no longer there. When they had assembled with the elders and consulted together, they gave large sum of money to the soldiers, the Roman soldiers, saying, Tell them his disciples came at night and stole him away while we slept. And if this comes to the governor's ears, we will appease him and make you secure. So they took the money and did as they were instructed. And this saying is commonly reported among the Jews until this day. Verse 16. Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee to the mountain, which Jesus had appointed for them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Verse 18. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me and in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. 
Very important context here, right? Remember in the first century, this is the Roman Empire at its height, at its apex. And only the emperor deserved worship according to their worldview. And they had a multiplicity of gods. And if you claimed that Jesus was God, guess what was going to happen to you? Not very good things. You were going to be put to death. So unless you're claiming the emperor of God, if you're claiming somebody else to be God, that's not a good situation. However, God, in, in the Great Commission, he's talking to his 11 disciples. And some, some scholars have pointed out it most likely was more than just the 11. He's speaking to them, and he's giving them this commission. He's giving them this commission to go out. But first, he brings them to the mountain of Galilee. And take note of this. So picture this in Galilee. They're coming up to the mountain, and they can view as, they can see as far as the eye can see. For them in their worldview at this time, it was only to the Jews. So that's all they knew. But Jesus is bringing them up there and said, hey, look out. I need you to go all as far as you can see through the entire world as you know it. Go. So for them, they didn't quite understand it at that time. But it would, it would be what we call and we see in the scriptures as the mystery of God. Meaning that it's not just for the Jews, it's for the Gentiles alike, which is why we're here. It's for all. So he takes them up there and he looks and says, hey, every language, every ethnicity, everyone, go. But first and foremost, so if you can for a second, I want you to picture yourself in that setting. First century Roman Empire. You're with Jesus. You're looking out. It's time to go. It's more than what I could ever imagine it is. Much broader than that. Much broader than that. Go. And Jesus, in verse 18, came to them. So the disciples are coming up, and they see Jesus from a little bit of afar. If you can imagine, a little bit of fear settling in. That, that's Jesus. He, he's risen. He, he, he's here. He's rose from the dead. So a little bit of fear have come into place. So Jesus sees that, acknowledges it, and goes to them. Did you see that? Jesus comes to them and speaks to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Mm. Point number one. Before we can be a disciple maker, we have to first be a disciple ourselves. A disciple literally is a follower. So we're followers of Jesus, which is why we're all here today. We're followers of the King of Kings. We're followers of Jesus. So the first to be a disciple maker, you first have to be a disciple. And I encourage you and implore you this morning, if you're sitting in the audience and uh, you're not a believer, if you have not put your faith in Christ, today is the day of salvation. Today is going to be, you're going, we're going to proclaim the gospel to you, the good news of Jesus Christ, which is what Pastor Brady does each and every Sunday. And we're going to do that again today. Oh, oh by the way, uh, if I say anything that you don't like, please feel free to email Brady. <laughs> you probably know his email address. Feel free to reach out to him. Don't tell him I said that. <laughs> so being a believer, being a disciple, being a follower ought to shift your mindset entirely. Before you're a believer, we've talked about this before, this means nothing to you. This is not your worldview. It's something else entirely. When you become a believer, all of a sudden, this is the prism in which we see life. This is our world view. This is how we make sense of the world around us. is through the word of God, his breath on a page. That changes drastically when you become a follower of his. When you become a believer in Christ, that changes drastically like that. When I became a believer at 18 years old, I grew up in the church. I actually grew up Church of Christ, interestingly enough, right? When I grew up, uh, I went to church every Sunday, every Sunday night, every Wednesday. Never, never professed Christ. I was in church, sitting, sitting in a pew every day, every Sunday, every Wednesday. Didn't really care about it. It was very lukewarm. Until I turned 18 years old and met my, met my wife, and it changed my life drastically. And when I, when I gave my life to Christ, my life changed forever. The way I spoke, the way I acted. The way, the way I was, was drastically different, night and day, night and day. 
So first and foremost, to be a disciple maker, you first must be a disciple yourself. Today is the day of salvation. Secondly, I want you to look at the authority in which Jesus has here. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore. So it's not on their own accord that they're going. Make note of that. That's not on them that they're going. They're going because Jesus tells them, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore. That's why they're going, in submission of Jesus, submitting to him as Lord and Master of their life. So that's the starting point. Submission to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. He's bigger than I am. He knows more than me. He knows what's best. I know nothing without him. Complete and utter submission with that mindset, with me becoming a follower of Jesus, with me becoming a disciple, with me submitting to him, go. Now, one might think, I, you know, I don't think I can, or I, I, I don't know enough. I'm an introvert. I, I don't feel equipped to do this. How do I handle tough questions? How do I speak to someone that's unbelievable? They're going to think I'm stupid, right? I, I, I just don't know. Know this. The creator of the universe knows you intimately. Knows you intimately. He knows how you think. He knows your concerns. He knows your fears. He knows your anxieties, your gifts, your personality. He knows it all. Know that. Know that you come humbly before him. You submit to him. He knows more than me. He's bigger than me. He is the creator of the universe. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations. So oftentimes we think that the, the imperative there is go. However, go is, is simply, it's assuming that the disciples will go forth throughout Israel itself and eventually throughout the whole world. So it's assuming, based on this submission to his authority, that they go. The command, the imperative, however, is make disciples. So the commission is not so much fulfilled in the going, but in the disciple-making. That's the commission. And on top of that, make disciples of all nations. Why do we need to do that? Simply put, because if they don't hear the gospel, they can't be saved. They can't believe. No distinction between the Jew and the Gentile. We know that. He who has ears, let him hear. Romans chapter 10, uh, verses 13 through 15. Let me flip over there real quick. Paul writes, For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amen. How then, how then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? That's the mindset. All nations. All nations. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word concerning Jesus Christ. You see, people come to salvation by believing potentially what a preacher says, what a Bible teacher says, what a Christian says, who have taken the gospel to them and have explained it by showing them the facts in support of it. And the facts are astounding. Simply put, that's why Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 that it's the power of God into salvation. It's that explosive power of God. You see, what happens is when someone hears the good news of Jesus, it's the explosive power of God into salvation. It's not the words I say or how I say it. It's God working in their life. It's the power of God 
unto salvation. You see, with that mindset, when we go and we talk to someone, it's God doing the work. I'm just a vessel. And how humble that is. I'm just here proclaiming to you, has nothing to do with me. It's in spite of me. It's all about Jesus. It's all about the creator of the universe. It may, in fact, according to 1 Corinthians, be a stumbling block to the Jew and, and foolishness to the Greek. But to those who are being saved, it's the power of God into salvation. The power of God to salvation. That's the point. You see, making disciples in this day and age in the first century was a sort of thing that rabbis would do. Kind of like Paul grew up and he knew all the Old Testament, as we would say today, right? He had a teacher. They had disciples of them. But Jesus' followers are to make disciples for Jesus, not for themselves. That's the mindset. That's the perspective. It's about him. It's not about us. You see, in the church today, not this church necessarily, the universal church I'm speaking of, in general has done a poor job of discipleship. In general. Some people think that if they affirm some doctrines, some truths in Scripture, that's good enough. There's no need to be actively involved in the local church. That's the mindset for some people. Brothers and sisters, by being faithful members of the local body of Christ, corporately worshiping the Creator, attending and participating in Bible studies, acts of service in the children's and youth ministry, behind the scenes, volunteering for VBS, in which I think the number was 13 little children came to Jesus during that week. That's being obedient to the commission. That's being obedient to making disciples. That's obedience. Go might be missionary across the world for some people. Not all. Not all people. Being obedient to the Great Commission can literally just be serving in your church and coming to corporate worship. Loving it. You see, for those Christians who, who simply don't go to worship or avoid being in the Word of God, here's the reality. They're being disobedient to the Great Commission. That's the reality of the situation. That's the truth of the matter. In fact, they may not actually know Lord as Savior. Speaking truth. Those who know the Lord crave the Word of God. They crave it. They have to have it. It's nourishment to their souls. You have to have the Word of God. And they crave fellowshipping with those in common faith. Those who love the Lord desire to worship. They long for it. We want to pray. Why do we give sacrificially of our time and of our resources and of our money? Why? Why do we do it? Because the creator of the universe has placed that desire in us. He has given us the drive to do it and commanded us to do it. You see, here's the thing. To be completely transparent, a few years ago, it was probably five years ago, uh, Brady called me up. I was in another church, loved their church, uh, loved the people at the church. Uh, he called me up and said, hey, man, I want you to come here and pastor with me. Okay, I declined it. I declined it. No, I'm happy at our church. Um, you know, I, I'm happy uh, teaching and, and being, being a deacon there and, and, and just being involved in the church because we love the people. I still love them. I said, okay. Fast forward three or four years, five years, whatever it was. Calls me up again. Hey, man, I feel compelled to have this conversation with you again. Immediately, my thought is, oh, I, you know, I love our church. And uh, I, I thought of something that someone told me, once told me, that if you have a desire in your heart, it's there for a reason. If you're a believer in Christ and you have a desire in your heart, 
My desire is to teach. My desire is to pastor. My desire is to be a disciple maker. Guess what? That desire is never leaving. It's not going away. The desire to worship, the desire to crave for the word of God, the desire to be here, desire to serve, the desire to serve in VBS, the desire to serve in youth is not going to go away. Submit to it. Submit to it and say yes. See, some of you don't know, but I actually run and operate a business too. And a business partner of mine, uh, we, we were given an opportunity five or six years ago and, uh, to start our own business with some investors. And uh, they came to us and said, hey, we want you to start this business for us. Huh, okay. I don't really know how to. I remember reading somewhere it said, uh, if you don't know how to do it, say yes and figure it out along the way. So that's what we did. Five years later, we're running a business. Step of faith. It's a step of faith. And, and knowing those desires are never going to leave. You see, as, as we live and breathe every day, we as disciples ought to see the great pleasure we have to be followers of the Most High. Everything we think, we do, we say. So Jesus calls us to go and make followers, to make disciples, not just converts. Distinction there. It's not just converts. Followers, people who love Jesus. And people who actively live out these doctrinal truths. Not just believing them, doing them. If we know the gospel, we ought to walk worthy of the gospel. If we don't have any fruit to show what is in us, then according to James, our faith is dead. Flip over to James chapter 1. James chapter 1, and we actually talked this talked about this last week in our Sunday school class. One of my favorite uh, several verses in all of Scripture. And I'll start in, verse, start in verse 21. James writes, Lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. Verse 22, here we go. But... Be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. So be doers, not hearers. So that mirror there that, that we're speaking of, it's not like a glass mirror that we're used to seeing today, right? It's not this perfectly glass mirror that you can see your image perfectly. That's not what it was. It was more of a metallic type of a shape, and you could kind of see, in theory, what you look like. Right, So that's the image here, is that they're looking in this, not mirror, but a mirror, and it kind of sees a distorted view of them. Right, So it's the image of someone looking in a mirror, seeing this distorted view, ignoring it, and keep going. That's the image. That's a hearer only, not a doer. I see it. I see who I am. I see what I'm like. Yeah, it's okay. I'll just keep going. That's a hearer of the word, not a doer. Verse 24. For he observes himself goes away and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. That's the distortion of looking at yourself in a mirror. But he who looks into the perfect law, here we go, of liberty and continues in it, he is not a forgetful here, but a doer of the work. This one will be blessed in what he does. So we, we are called to be doers of the word and not hearers only lest we deceive ourselves. You see, the nature of that discipleship was spelt out in two further points here that is going to be made. The next one is, of course, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We see that. So go, therefore, make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Words matter, and the, in the order of the words matter. You notice that next in line here is baptizing them. That's the first part of it. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Back in uh, Matthew chapter 3, verse 11, if, you're, if you recall this, um, so it's very similar to what we see in, John, in the John the Baptist case, 
where, where John the Baptist says in verse 11 of chapter 3 of Matthew, I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, and I am not fit to remove his sandals. He will baptize you with Holy Spirit and fire. Ba baptizing you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The phrase there that's important, though, that we need to take note of, and it's alluded to several times in the Old Testament, it's baptizing them in the name of. That's important. In the name of. You see Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 5. Here we go. For the Lord your God has chosen him out of all the tribes, the Levites, to stand to minister in the name of the Lord, in the name of God most high, in the name of the Lord, him and his sons forever. Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 22. When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, often we see this phrase. 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 45. Here we go, David and the Philistine. David and Goliath. You come to me with the sword, David says, with a spear and with a javelin. But I come to you in what? In the name of the Lord of the host, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. Psalm 118, 26. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you from the house of the Lord. Micah 4, 5. For all people, for all people walk in, each, in, in the name of uh, his God. But we walk in the name of the Lord, our God, forever and ever. In the name of the Creator. You see, the finite mind can deal only through His name. But His name is of no avail detached from His nature. When one is baptized in this trinity, he professes and acknowledges God in all that he is, in all that he does for man. He recognizes and depends upon God the Father as creator, as preserver. He receives Jesus Christ as the only mediator and redeemer in his pattern of life and confesses the Holy Spirit as his sanctifier and comforter. That's baptism. In the name of denotes the one to whom allegiance is pledged. This formula, this Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, is striking because nowhere else in the New Testament does this occur. The only other time that the three persons were involved is what? When Jesus was baptized. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. When we are baptized, that's, that's converting the individual. That's them showing the outward obedience to following Jesus to following the creator of the universe, to following the only true God. You see, the word order is important. Baptism is what happens when someone comes into faith. Think about the times in which the originals, as I would call them, the apostles, the disciples, right? Think about the times in which the originals went into homes in Scripture in the first century. Entire households were baptized. Think about the examples. Why is that? You ever thought about that? Why is that? Because heads of the household have influence on their children. Fathers. It's Father's Day. Mothers. So as parents, this ought to be a natural process for us as believers. To disciple our children. To disciple our children. They will come to know the grace of God in their lives at an early age. Make it a point of emphasis to disciple your children. Um, er, earlier on in, in Matthew, I believe it's Matthew chapter 13, I think it's verse 8. Um, Jesus is talking about the little children to come to him in faith. So even Jesus is saying, bring the little children to me. That they might have faith in me. Do not lead a little one astray. The millstone. Anybody seen that, heard, seen that verse? So Jesus says, if you, leave, if you led or lead a little one astray, it's the equivalent 
to, in the first century, what they would do is if they had slaves or someone committed a crime, they would put them on a ship, put them out in the middle of the sea. They would tie a millstone around their neck. Y'all know what a millstone is? It's a giant granite rock. And they would toss them over the ship. Jesus says, if you, leave, if you lead a little one astray, if you are not discipling your children, if you are letting the earth disciple them or the world disciple them in something else entirely that's not Jesus Christ, you might as well do that. That's a warning. We ought to be, we are commanded to disciple our children. Fathers, I'm speaking to you. I'm speaking to myself. We need to be, we are commanded to disciple our children. Children, not plural. We are called, commanded to disciple our children. And I'll touch on this real quick. Idolatry. Paul hit on it, the originals hit on it in the first century when they were going and growing, growing the church. Athens in particular. When they approached Athens, there's a multiplicity of gods. Uh, and as a matter of fact, there was a whole business set aside for it of making idols to worship. Physical idols to worship. So Paul would go and embolden that he was in the Holy Spirit and say, no. The only God you sh are, should be worshiping is the creator of the universe, the one true God. And so every time Paul would go to a new city, he would go straight at him in that regard. And we think oftentimes in the world that we live in, we think idolatry is done. That's not the case. It's not the case. Idolatry is anything that you put above your worship with God, your worship for God. If there's anything in your, in your order of priorities that is above God, that's sinful. That's called idolatry. As a matter of fact, I'll go ahead and say this. I said it on Wednesday night. I'll say it again. Um, my son likes to play baseball. He enjoys playing baseball. He's on, he's on his little all-star team. And uh, why not? I'll, I'll be bold. Um, there was uh, the, the individual who run Dizzy Dean had, in the past had never played baseball on Sunday mornings. Now they think it's appropriate to play baseball on Sunday mornings, 9, 10, 11 a.m. That's not okay. That's not okay. And what they've done is, is they put, they've, they've, they've told these parents, they said, hey, I need you to make a choice between Little League Baseball, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 years old. I need you to make a decision between playing baseball on Sunday morning, 9, 10, 11, and going and worshiping God. That's sinful. If those individuals are believers, they need to repent. It is what it is. That's sinful. If he sees it, he sees it. I'm all right with that. It's time to be bold. That's sinful. It needs to change. Idolatry. Anything that's above worshiping God is idolatry. Second point there. I'll get off my soapbox. Second point there. Go, therefore, make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. Teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. That's the second point. You see, this great commission does not end with the conversion of the unbeliever. We must walk alongside them just like Jesus did when he talked to his originals, his disciples. Come follow me. Come follow me. And Jesus, what? Walked alongside them. That's discipleship. Let's go back to our examples. You know, for Bethany, if you remember that, the first example, Bethany already had a relationship with Ashley, and they're involved in each other's lives. This gives Bethany an opportunity to speak about her growing relationship with Jesus. She could bring up a Bible verse that has impacted her recently, or what she's learned about God through a difficult circumstance. Taking the first step and starting those conversations about faith opens the door to continue the conversation. Joey, Brian's son, shares with him about some difficulty or some difficult things happening at school. Brian could offer to pray for him. By praying for Joey, Brian is modeling for his son what having a conversation with God sounds like. The next step for Brian could be inviting Joey to pray with him. 
giving Joey the opportunity to continue the conversation with God with someone he trusts. So as fathers, we ought to be modeling, as mothers, we ought to be modeling to our children what prayer looks like. We ought to be modeling to the kids in the back in the children's ministry. We ought to, be, ought to be modeling to the youth what prayer looks like. Allow them to do it. On our, on our little baseball team, I've uh, started to do that with our, with our kids before the game. I pray, and then they pray after me. It's twofold, right? Showing them how to pray. I want them to pray, and I want them to step up and be leaders and pray. Studying the Bible together. Studying the Bible with someone else could be as simple as reading scripture, reflecting on it, and discussing what you observe and how this applies to everyday life. Remember Christine? Christine prayed about who to study the Bible with. Nicole, a co-worker, came to mind. They become friends, or they became friends, within the last two years and have briefly talked about their Christian faith. During the lunch break, Christine asked Nicole if she's ever studied the Bible with someone. She invites Nicole to read through the Gospel of John one small section at a time and discuss it during their lunch break. That's discipleship. I think sometimes we, we, take it, we, we think it's more difficult than it is. It's walking alongside someone, showing them what being a Christ follower is like, stepping up and doing it. It's leadership. And, and youth, uh, it, here's some numbers. We get these numbers on Wednesday night. These numbers are... Uh, crazy. Back in 2019, I think it's Pew Research or Barna, one or the other. These numbers are staggering, guys. Um, 70% of youth after leaving high school, their high school youth group, never graced the doors of a church ever again. 70%. That was 2019. I'm sure those numbers have elevated since. Why? Discipleship. We've got to grab our young people. We have to get our kids and disciple them. Show them what a Christ follower looks like. Show them what boldness looks like. Show them what praying looks like. Show them what worshiping looks like. Show them what priorities look like. Make worship a priority. Make worshiping the creator of the universe the priority. So for me, I think sometimes, in closing... Uh, sometimes I, I get asked a lot what I do, right? Uh, what, what do you do? And my first inclination is to say, oh, I run a business. That should not be my first inclination. My first inclination, the thought should be, I am a Christ follower. I am a disciple of Jesus. I am a disciple maker. That should be the priority. That should be who we are. And at this point, um, if, if you don't know Jesus as the Lord of your life, that's where the process starts. That's where the process starts. If you don't know Jesus as Lord and Savior, my encouragement, my, I, I'm imploring you at this time uh, to please come forward. If not, um, I, talk to me after the service. I'd love to have a conversation with you and tell you what the next step are. But to be frank and to tell you the truth of the gospel, Jesus came, okay? Jesus came. He had followers. He performed miracles, well documented in, in, in the scriptures, okay? And above all, he went to the cross as proclaimed thousands of years prior, died on the cross, and what did he do? He rose from the dead. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 says that 500 plus people saw him. 500 plus. It's well documented if we were in the court of law and you had 500 eyewitnesses to something, what do you think would happen? It's a slam dunk. That's the gospel. That's the good news. Jesus defeated the death, or defeated death for you. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this morning, God. I thank you for the opportunity to come and to, and to God, to, to uh, share your word, Lord, and to study, study your word together, God. I, I thank you for this opportunity, God. I pray, Father, that today, that as we leave, uh, Father, that, God, we, we would apply these principles, we would apply these doctrines to our life, God, that we would, uh, first and foremost, we would be a follower of you in your way, in your truth, and that, God, we would pull somebody alongside us and we would show them what that looks like. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.